we can maybe get started now. And I'd like to uh, welcome everyone for today's session. It's great that you're all here. And we have a very important and good session today. We have a guest with us that is going to share her experiences and uh, some case studies. So we can start with just a, a quick presentation uh, from today's session. I'll share uh, my screen. So this is the third session of the SI learning series, uh, where we're going to present uh, case studies on systems innovation. And for the ones uh, who don't know, this is part of the SI learning series that we're preparing a five month learning experience that we're going to uh, have until June 28th, uh, where we're going to explore uh, ideas, tools and case studies and challenges on each one of the five modules that we have here at SI, systems innovation, systems thinking, systems inquiry, systems change and systems building. So, as I said, this is the, the third session, case studies on systems innovation, and we're going to hear from Anita uh, very soon, some of her experience on this field. Um, my name is Yasmin. I work at uh, Systems Innovation as a community developer, and I'm going to be your host uh, today. And I'm very pleased to share that our guest today is Anita and a bit about her. She's uh, specialized in supporting cities and region in their economic, social and political transitions towards climate neutrality and resilience. She's passionate about complexities and systems transformation and through her collaboration with national, regional and city leaders, she supports them building paths, strategies, processes, and experiments uh, towards shaping and achieving a common vision. Her main areas of expertise are transformations towards climate neutrality and resilience in cities with special focus on just transformation of coal dependent cities, governance and policy innovation, as well as strategic long-term systems thinking and strategic systems innovation. She worked at Climate Kick as a systems innovator design manager, managing long-term projects and processes of just transformation in Poland, as well as supporting Krakow in climate uh, neutrality ambition, and also worked as a senior analyst at uh, Wise Europa leading post coal Future Lab and Community Lab projects. So this is going to be a very, very exciting session. And uh, without further ado, um, Anita, please welcome to today's session. Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm, I'm super happy to, to be here and super excited about both sharing a little bit of um, my and actually not only my personal uh, learnings and, and observations. Um, and uh, I hope that we will have a very fruitful uh, conversations and uh, we will also uh, stay connected later on because uh, I believe that this is a super important power of uh, of this community. Uh, maybe just to, to add what uh, Yasmin has al already said, apart from this uh, very uh, professional profile that, that you heard of, uh, I'm also a councillor um, in, in Warsaw um, from, from Vola district, so I'm a kind of part of the uh, decision making like a local parliament but also I'm uh, uh, I'm an independent councillor and uh, this is because uh, I have created uh, my own uh, movement uh, association of, of active citizens in uh, city of Warsaw willing to to transform the city for uh, for better and to to take actions uh, themselves to uh, to do so and uh, mm, now I have uh, prepared a little bit of uh, presentation uh, so that uh, we could follow a um, little bit uh, more what, what I have been uh, involved in. Um, 
and uh, this presentation will be also having a little bit of stops so that uh, it wouldn't be super boring. Um, and uh, there will be also a part of discussion at the end. And uh, I believe that uh, I have already introduced uh, myself. Uh, we had the intro by, by Yasmin, but I think it's now also time to get to know each other a little bit. Uh, maybe you could uh, share with us uh, what is actually bringing you here? What is your curiosity about this session, whether you are involved in the just transition or you're interested in systems innovation? Uh, yeah, please, please, please share. <laughs> So we have the, the mirror board here. We have a, a session for you to put some stickies here. Um, what brought you here? So maybe we can just have one to two minutes for you to put your main ideas. And of course, you can unmute yourself as well if you want to. Good. So we have here an inspired by systems innovation applications. Always helpful to have real life examples, case studies of putting systems innovation to practice. Um, my frustration towards gap between knowledge and action. Uh, learn, came to learn systems innovation, systems thinking approaches. Here's successes. That's a very good one. <laughs> Interested in labs and how they work. In your example. Success stories. Okay, preparing case studies, not an easy task. I joined to know more about the process. Great. Connect with others doing similar work. Learn more about applying systems thinking theory, um, systems thinking beyond theory. Great. Awesome. Cool. Happy to, to hear so many, so many needs. Um, I think that probably I won't be able to, to address 100% of, of each of them, but uh, I hope that we can stay in touch and even maybe have some, some follow-ups, like, for example, as to detailed mechanics of uh, post-code feature lab, we can have a separate uh, chat around it, uh, because today we won't have time to, to have enough of a, of a deep dive into, into the, uh, everything what, what has been designed and everything what, what has been tested. So it will be more of a light touch today. Um, and uh, also, for example, as to as to case study and uh, to, to those who are uh, searching for success stories, um, I will mention one also at, at the end, um, but also you can, you can find a reference um, in one of uh, 
publications that I was uh, recently uh, co-developing. Co uh, it's called uh, How to Break the Barriers to Transformation. Uh, you can find it on, on my LinkedIn among the, the publications. So I think that there is, maybe they are not, um, they are not like super uh, about uh, systems innovation because the, the, the many of those positive changes were happening not within the systems innovation frameworks, but uh, they are also positive uh, case studies. And uh, to those who are also curious about other um, positive examples from the uh, system innovation world, uh, we can also have a separate chat or maybe separate uh, talk around that. All right, uh, cool. So uh, in such a case, um, let me share my screen and uh, I will present a couple of things now. So I will share uh, the insights from um, initiative called post Cold Future Lab, uh, which we have organized with uh, EIT Climate Kick and also international partners. Uh, but also I will put a little bit uh, more of uh, uh, learnings from, from other connected initiatives and, and projects. I will make it in a, in a smooth way, otherwise we would go crazy what was learned where. And uh, what will be the, the order? First, I will uh, describe a little bit of, of the context uh, of the Just Transition, Just Transition in Europe, in Poland and uh, in communities, a little bit around how is the situation uh, looking, especially for those who are uh, not super familiar with the uh, with the just transition uh, concept or with the current just transition frameworks. I think this will be interesting to be more on the same page. Uh, then I will also talk about uh, the intent of collaborations with uh, which we are having. Um, this will be about basically reframing uh, the challenge which is ahead. Then I will also talk about. Uh, how we are understanding the, the system, what uh, gaps and blockages and leverage points we found and we are focusing on. Um, then I will also talk about uh, what we have activated, what we have been uh, testing. Also, I will not talk about everything because there was uh, quite a lot. And uh, then uh, I will move on to, to, to the intelligence. Uh, so what learnings, uh, what are the main learnings which we are having so far? And of course, there is much more learnings, um, which we could also be, be discussing, but I will share with you the, the ones that I, I think that are the most important. And then we will have a little bit uh, discussion. I hope uh, this will be very uh, fruitful for and interesting for everyone. So yeah, let's uh, jump to, to the first uh, item on, on the list, a little bit of context. So the just transition uh, means greening the economy in a way that is uh, as fair as inclu as, and inclusive as possible to everyone uh, concerned, creating decent work opportunities and leaving no one behind. This is the definition which is, uh, um, which is uh, presented by International Labour Organization. And uh, this is very similar to, to the definition which, for example, European Union, European Commission uh, took also as, as, as its own. So especially this, this part about leaving no one behind. And uh, in, in Europe, in the European Union, uh, the just transition forms a part of the European Green Deal, uh, a key uh, part. And the European Green Deal, uh, as probably many of you know, is, the, is this um, program of social and economic development of the EU. And uh, currently this, uh, just there is a just transition mechanism, special mechanism uh, to, to ensure the just transition happens. And uh, it is um, created for coal, lignite, peat and oil shale regions. But in future, it is expected that also other regions which are uh, depending on um, very carbon intensive industries will also, um, will also be embraced by, by this special support. And uh, this is how the, the mechanism looks currently. So there is first pillar, which is, uh, which is mainly grants, uh, pretty, quite a bunch of money, uh, so-called just transition funds. There is second pillar, which is a special uh, scheme under InvestEU, which is guarantees to stimulate investment in priority areas, mainly 
uh, for the private sector. And then there is the third pillar, which is a public sector loan facility to uh, to support uh, to to uh, support to the, the the grants to complement because many times they may be not enough. And um, uh, currently, mainly the the discussion and uh, the, the focus uh, of most of the stakeholders, but it seems that also of the uh, of the decision makers of the European Commission and institutions is around this just transition fund. So uh, this uh, big uh, bucket of uh, of money, which uh, should be distributed among those regions eligible, and. Um, what was created is uh, also a um, special just transition platform where uh, key decision makers, so for example, commissioners or people working for the commission, um, representatives of national or regional and some uh, local governments and uh, key stakeholders are attending. Uh, they are organizing meetings once per quarter to, to share some, some insights, some learnings, and uh, collaborate. And apart from that, uh, some technical assistance is, is available, mainly focusing on uh, supporting uh, the identification of, of projects which could be uh, eligible for the Just Transition Fund or supporting uh, cities' strategies. And uh, then uh, having a, a look at uh, Poland, which is, which is my home country, um, I wanted to share with you what is our situation because it, within all the just transition, it's it's pretty special. Uh, this is mainly because um, as much as 70% of our electricity and 42 of primary energy comes from coal and lignite. And so this means already a big uh, transformation in terms of technology and a lot of investment. But then the other par portion of the challenge is, is that Around 100,000 people is employed in, in coal and lignite mines and power plants. And this is uh, around 54% of all EU employees in this, uh, in this sector. And there are six uh, regions uh, in which uh, coal and lignite mining um, activities are, uh, are happening. And uh, one of those regions uh, is, uh, is um, uh, having a lot of these activities. Uh, it is home to as much as 42% of coal and lignite miners in EU, and uh, as much as uh, 80% in, in Poland. So most of those activities are happening in Silesia, but not only. And uh, uh, together with my colleagues, we were um, also preparing some reports, and we found that mining and uh, power plants provide even uh, up to 50 or 60% of uh, some local government's income. This is not the case for every local government, but uh, it can be as high as that. So this means when th that when this income disappears, uh, basically the, the local government will not have uh, money to uh, cover for the very basic, uh, very basic needs, like for example, to um, pay to, to the teachers, which, which they are um, paying to. And uh, then the other part is, is also that due to mines closures in, in Poland in 19th and early 2000s, around 300,000 miners already lost their jobs. And uh, this was happening in a very rapid way. This was happening without uh, really good and well thought uh, this, this and designed uh, policies. It was more something like ministers from the capital were coming to the uh, to the region especially to Silesia and they were announcing closure of of the mines and um, the the uh, the support which we were they were offering was uh, totally not helpful it was out of place and uh, this caused that whole communities and cities uh, basically uh, collapsed um, further closures were for this reason, postponed since since three decades because this was uh, th this has uh, left a lot of trauma uh, among the the, the society, uh, not only of the of the coal regions but uh, across all Poland. People are uh, not remembering those those times well, and uh, even though cost of the carbonization of Poland will be much lower than in action. 
the currently the central government's narratives on, on Polish uh, black gold are are very strong, and um, some some are saying that we have a call for for two hundred years uh, and we should uh, stick to that. We should not. Uh, transform and this is also very harmful especially for um for those who are on the ground and are trying uh, to to make the transition happen uh, not too late and uh, to happen in a in a just uh, way and uh, this kind of narratives are also blocking people's own personal strategies what to do with their future if they are hearing very contradictory messages, like for example, Mayor is saying that the mine will close soon, the government would be saying that it will not, um, or even not hold the government, but maybe some representatives, uh, it's enough for people to be like super confused and uh, to to also start uh, losing their, their hope and their trust in, uh, in, in others, especially in the public authorities. And uh, the situation in uh, in communities. Uh, so, according to the just transition plans, uh, which are uh, which were needed to to be eligible to the just transition funds, uh, mines in Poland uh, are being closed already now, but uh, they will be gradually closed till 2049. And um, the mayors uh, quite often say that uh, they don't have any idea how to build an economic alternative to, to coal or to lignite uh, and how they could or how could they attract uh, this alternative if, if not building uh, themselves within the community. And uh, just an example of, of our work is um, town of, of Bierun, which, which I wanted to share with you. Under the post Coal Future Lab, there was a set of, uh, set of activities, set of uh, workshops organized uh, with the with the local community, with the uh, civil servants, but also with the uh, business representatives and with the youth, and um, this was um, uh, th this was organized this way that uh, people were encouraged to dream and to share their dreams. This way, they were creating more of a community and uh, more of a hope. Uh, but then, when our facilitator has has asked uh, the youth um, about their dreams and how they see their future, if the, all of those their dreams came true, would they stay in the city? The answer was uh, from 12 out of 23 participants was that they would leave the town even if uh, their dreams came true. So more than half of this group uh, said that they would leave anyways. Mm, six said that if their dreams came true, they would, they would stay. And five, uh, said that they didn't believe their dreams will ever come true. And I think that this is like a super, super uh, sad constatation, and but also showing how much current uh, policies and programs of the EU are not uh, not reaching and not uh, embracing what is really happening on the on the local level, uh, what is happening with the, within the groups which are among those most relevant, even if not, not maybe even the, the most relevant uh, for, for the just uh, transition. And maybe I'll uh, make a small pause here if, if you have any comments or any questions, uh, please, you can ask now. There's a, a comment uh, here in the chat. Uh, Erika, would you like to, to address it? Oh, I'm happy to come off mute. Um, yeah, thank you so much for that. It just made me reflect on things that happened in British history, you know, the, the closing down of the coal mines in the 80s here, and that's really impacted the you know, communities in the north of England, and the communities are still suffering today. And you know, the idea of, like, you know, when you are transitioning, you do need that funding. And now that there's talk of expanding the UNES, so the ultra-low emission zone in London, and yes, there is some funding for people to transition to more sustainable vehicles, but again, is that enough? So I can see that the, with the just transition mechanism, that's quite a lot of funding. So yeah, some question about whether it's enough, where is that threshold? So yeah, actually, actually, this uh, I, I will answer this, I think, uh, Later on in, in the presentation, so maybe maybe if you will allow me, I will I will leave this answer for a little bit later. 
and Joss? Yeah, I think it's um, the point about lack of imagination. I think that's normally the situation you find, isn't it? It's like you go into these systems and there's quite little, um, well, there's almost no kind of innovation on the systems level and there's very little imagination on that level. It's normally like any kind of innovation or imagination sorry about background noise, is, is in the form of maybe some new shiny technology, you know, that can do this or can do that. Um, but exactly as you say, I think that is most, almost the biggest missing component in all of this. Uh, yes, to totally agree. And precisely that's also why we, uh, we with, uh, with our local facilitators, we have decided for this, uh, just dreaming lab to to encourage people to to dream to to come together and share their the dreams that they have and to see how many of them they actually have in in common, and uh, precisely this is also about this this thinking about uh, about this uh, single point solutions or shiny technologies which will come and transform the societies. Thank you for this insight. Yeah, we have uh, Michael here on the chat. It's interesting to see how Houston, which is the fossil fossil energy capital of the U.S., is approaching the energy transition. Would you like to uh, explore more of this comment? Um, hi. Yeah, I was looking into this recently in the context of you know clean clean tech. Um, and I was pretty impressed by the way that they'd approached I mean, I don't know how the original analysis was done, um, but it was really very much a mission-driven approach. I, I haven't seen what they're doing on the ground um, in terms of you know, community involvement to such a large extent, but the, pro the problems are the same in terms of you know, how do we transition a significant portion of our workforce and infrastructure and industry um, into a, a a greener future, and what what does that mean? And you know which jobs are impacted, and how. So it, it was a very specific, um, let's say, thoughtful way of trying to leverage the existing infrastructures and know how um, as a way as a basis for that transition, and accepting that there would be some losses along the way in terms of capacity and capability in people. Um, but thinking, you know, and putting in place infrastructures to allow individuals to make that transition if they wanted to. Thank you. I believe it would it would be also good if we probably connected later later or later on. I would be curious to to hear more about about your example. So Yasmin, can we continue? <laughs> yes, all right. Yes. So let's go to the next stage uh, of, of uh, my presentation. So now is the time to uh, to tell you a little bit more about the intent of, of uh, our collaborations and how we are reframing the, the challenge which is ahead. So as you can already, um, as you were already hearing the, for coal regions, the, the transition to uh, coal and lignite regions, uh, transition to a climate neutral economy is extremely challenging. It's uh, it's something more challenging that, for example, for cities like uh, like Warsaw, for example, where, where we uh, do not have this this kind of uh, dependency on, on coal or, or lignite that uh, people are actually employed. And uh, also we don't have this kind of dependency that this forms a part of our identity. So. So for people from, from big cities, uh, many times it is the case that uh, energy, electricity, electricity is basically coming from the plug and we are not thinking what is the process behind it, uh, where is it actually coming, what, who's making what kind of sacrifices, who's losing health, uh, what kind of emissions it, it is producing, how it is uh, impacting our planet. And um, the current mechanisms which, uh, which, are, which were designed and which are functioning including the funds available are far not enough. And uh, uh, there is a pretty broad stakeholders awareness of it. Many people are talking about that we need um, something different, that we need to uh, transform the systems 
But then the issue is also that they are not actually understanding what do they mean by transforming the systems. And they are not also imagining that there might be actually some methodologies or tools to, to help to transform these systems. And uh, this awareness that uh, transition is not only about technology and environment, but also economy, society, governance, and basically uh, all the, the world around us, uh, and the interrelations between these worlds, uh, it, it is growing. We, we can hear more and more about it. But uh, the most of, uh, of the actors are still organized in the, let's say, old way. Uh, they and they act as if it was uh, a simple, a, a tame problem, uh, not a complex challenge, which should be addressed very differently. And uh, we uh, need to reframe the question that uh, that we are posing, especially the question which is like kind of implied by the solution provided by by the EU, by the Just Transition Fund, instead of asking. Uh, what projects do we need to prepare for the Just Transition Fund? We need to start asking, how can we make the desired transformations happen? What do, does it mean actually to, to transform? And then to, to choose appropriate tools and then choose appropriate pathologies, then choose, design the, uh, the projects and uh, activities and interconnect them to ensure uh, the impact that we want to achieve. And uh, I can remember also a, a talk which I had with uh, uh, some mayors of of, uh, of uh, cities, which were talking about that actually the the uh, the their previous strategy that they had it was based it was created just for them to be able to to get some external funding from the EU. It was not uh, a strategy to make the city better it was not a strategy really with a with a vision and helping also everyone in the city understanding what we are willing to achieve together it was just about bringing more funds for for some projects uh, useful or not so much there were different projects because what was also mothering was to to show in in the tables and then show in the campaigns how much money from the eu we brought to the city and uh, together with uh, EIT Climate Kick and uh, and partners, we we collaborate with uh, especially with those who recognize the need for for this different approach. Uh, and of course, not everyone is uh, understanding what actually is needed. But already, when someone is aware that the way which uh, which we have been operating so till now, I mean, the, the way which, for example, municipalities or communicate uh, communities were um, collaborating or not. Uh, they, uh, it is not the, the correct way, way forward and a new path needs to be established. And um, now let's have a look a little bit at our understanding of the, of the system on at the uh, key gaps, blockages and, and the leverage points that, uh, that we have uh, spotted and that we uh, are uh, trying to, to work with. So among the, the key gaps and blockages, uh, we have observed that Brussels is something uh, extremely far away from from people, from the communities. Communities also understand understood in very broad sense. So all of the actors which are there, from uh, from NGOs, from citizens, but also from from the business which is there, from from the mayors, especially from from the smaller uh, cities or uh, municipalities, and uh, and also the the academia. And the, the top-down approach um, and uh, language barriers, they do exist. And um, this uh, just transition platform of which I was uh, mentioning before, um, it is a platform in, uh, which creates some, some space for, for the key players of the, of the just transition. They can come and meet uh, or exchange once per quarter or sometimes establish connections between themselves and collaborate a little bit more afterwards or in between those meetings. Uh, but also the, uh, this is not enough because um, many, mostly those people who are coming, they are just those, those key players and those who are needing the, the support the most, uh, they are not, not involved. Some portion of this is the language barrier, some portion of it is not understanding how important it is, 
some portion is because the just transition is, is associated as something for ecologists, something for this 2% of green people. It's not framed as um, something about the future of ours and our kids. And um, within this top-down approach, uh, what can be also observed is that uh, the so-called technical assistance uh, supposedly helping uh, the beneficiaries of, of the Just Transition Fund, we can see that this technical uh, assistance is provided by um, by the uh, some big uh, organizations. Um, I don't know if uh, if you have heard of this uh, of this uh, recent publication from Professor Mariana Matsukato, uh, but uh, the the big con this is discussing that uh, how the the big uh, corporations, big uh, ad, uh, advisory consultancies, uh, how they are. Um, disabling the, the governments to take the actions themselves and how they are also not providing quality support, the support that, that would be actually needed and that would be the most fruitful. So um, in my discussions with uh, some uh, some organizations on, on the ground, they also have this feeling that the technical assistance should be actually channeled through those who are already active on the ground, who are willing to take the lead on the just transition, who are willing to, to support their communities. But uh, they are actually taking the tools away because of this uh, top-down approach, because there are some uh, PwCs, World Bank, uh, or some other big consultancies who are believed to have the holy grails. But, but in reality, uh, those big consultancies are uh, many times uh, basing only on uh, on the knowledge which which they can get uh, from from the local actors who are already there and who are not getting remunerated for for what they are sharing with them. So this is a little bit of uh, kind of a portion of of the system and uh, some uh, some error which which needs to be fixed. And then uh, the uh, other. Uh, blockage and then which is there is that the as I was mentioning already some kind of projectosis is uh, is existing so uh, this idea that we need to prepare projects uh, and we need to do it fast we need to get the funding um we need to come up with with good ideas but we actually don't know how often those projects are invented by one or two two persons sometimes officials sometimes someone for example who's uh, who's um uh, working for for a business but this actually is hindering uh, emergence and uh, reinventing the communities by by themselves they are not there there is no starting points that they would actually come together and thinking about what they want to achieve, where they want to go together, and then through which ways they want to they want to achieve that. There is actually the the opposite. Uh, so much focus uh, and effort on on projects um, that uh, there is no space for for proper collaboration and reinventing, finding alternatives. And uh, also, there are no transformation processes. This is everything is based on on projects and also long term thinking. We need to. Get the funding fast. We need to spend it fast uh, by 2026. Instead of thinking around about that transformation is is happening for uh, for many many years, tens of years, and um, there is also no approach which would be encouraging creation of of portfolio of uh, portfolios of, of projects. There are only existing either separate projects or in best cases pipelines of of projects, and. Um, this is happening. This is needing to happen extremely, extremely fast. And uh, no tools uh, supporting uh, transformations are um, are present among most most of the communities, apart from rare examples, which to which I will reference later also. And uh, there exists a kind of a myth of a prince in shiny armor who who is going to come and save those. Uh, those communities. So they, for tens of years, or in some cases, even hundreds of years, they were used to having the mine, the big employer, but also uh, this um, kind of organization who was uh, organizing a lot of life after work, like some, some parties, uh, 
or some some community events supporting uh, sports clubs uh, supporting uh, education etc and um, now uh, if uh, if the, the the eu is uh, coming with uh, these big buckets of, of money uh, they are kind of like a filling in this this place uh, they are trying to be a little bit of this prince in, in shiny armor will come and save you with this money but the issue is that this is actually cementing those communities from from finding the strengths within themselves from rethinking themselves from finding their their own potentials and from um from changing the dynamics within within themselves from from building trust and, and collaboration and um uh, now I will move on to to the leverage points. So those those points which uh, we believe that if we will uh, invest into, if we will work in those uh, in those spaces, they can bring uh, much uh, much greater effects than than even themselves. They can have a multiplied effects which will be spilling over uh, onto different different domains. Uh, and uh, through this way, interventions on, on the leverage points, they can be also um, compared to technique of, of acupuncture that we precisely want to um, take action in, in those spots to heal the body. Um, so first of them is increasing the stakeholder awareness and uh, capabilities, as well as engagement, um, both uh, locally region and uh, regionally. Um, generating place-based transformative visions and solutions, experimenting to to learn and uh, support what is what is emerging, uh, understanding specific challenges and connections within multiple communities, towns, cities, regions, and countries, and uh, fostering local, regional, cross regional, and international collaborations. And uh, now uh, I will move on to uh, what we've been actually doing with that, with uh, with what we have discovered, with what we found out, and what what kind of sense we made out of what we found out. How we are turning this into action. So, the Post Cold Futures Lab mission is to become a kind of practical, experimental, and participatory pillar of just transition. This is not about this uh, bunch of money and uh, telling people that you, you need to uh, apply fast, otherwise the money will be lost. Uh, this is about uh, reversing uh, reversing the efforts which we are which are being put to uh, to the more more local and uh, regional level and helping to uh, to experiment. Uh, we co-create uh, kind of laboratories to to support collaboration, innovation, and emergence to to flourish. In 2022, there were there were established um, laboratories in four uh, in four uh, regions, and uh, this is the the general design how how the whole post cold future lab uh, is uh, is working. There are those mini labs on the local or regional level. And then there is also a connector, the post cold future main lab, which is connecting and harvesting the, the knowledge and helping to um, to share, to to also co-create on this higher level, uh, which is also <clears throat> sharing insights and, and demonstrators uh, with the European Union and member states. And this, uh, we hope that will also feedback uh, to through the policy uh, and uh, through the just transition mechanism. And uh, we support the transformative mindsets, connections, capabilities, and uh, knowledge through a portfolio of uh, deliberate actions. And among them, there are, for example, trainings, webinars, workshops. Uh, as I was mentioning, there is also a report on best practices in overcoming transformation barriers. Uh, we have also organized a call for experiments and we have uh, a lot of direct uh, engagements and this is uh, just in in this uh, first starting uh, phase uh, for 2022 and uh, now we will be moving on also probably switching a little bit our activities and just a small note that uh, with our experiments nothing uh, explodes and i'm saying this uh, very with uh, very, very deliberately as uh, this is also something what we are trying to support with uh, 
the communities that we are working with. Some time ago, I was hearing when I would use a word experiment, for example, in front of a of a mayor or someone from from the community, I would hear like, "No, we don't want to experiment. We don't want anything to expose here. We are not rats. We are not experimenting." But uh, we are trying to help to understand that uh, experimentation is actually something what can help to avoid making a big mistake. It can help to uh, throw the money into something what will maybe not work or even bring counter effects. And many times those smaller interventions, they can help us to learn really a lot about the system. So we are trying to um change the this this image which experiment the word experimentation itself is have is is having and uh we are also helping the governments uh national regional and local to to become become kickboxers of of their challenges and talking about uh, kickboxers i mean that a kickboxer when when wants to kick the, the punching back uh, properly to, to make a proper impact, like really with a lot of force, needs to turn the, the foot. And actually the foot allows to engage all of the body and uh, it uh, also decides about the direction of all the, all the movement. So we are encouraging the, the public officials to, to work with, uh, with all of the communities, with, with all of the stakeholders, because uh, on this collaboration depends the impact that uh, this work will have, whether the just transition could be achieved or not. The, the, this collaboration is, uh, is crucial here. And I will stop for a moment for, for comments at this stage, and there will be still something more. <laughs> uh, there were some uh, questions here before, but since we have, um... At 12 minutes, maybe I'll just address one now and then one afterwards. So this one is from Michael. How did you go about quantifying the value impact of addressing particular points of intervention? Um, so we haven't been actually quantifying them like... Uh, we did not collect uh, data like in terms of numbers. Uh, this is more about understanding how the system works, what are the dynamics, and uh, where those uh, interventions can unlock, unlock something bigger in the system. And just to say quickly, you know, my, you were you were driving towards it a little bit. So systems dynamic modeling allows you to, let's say, estimate um, if you change a parameter, i.e. a point of intervention, what the result would be. So, you know, it, it, by modeling complex systems, you can effectively develop um, a, a strategy, if you will, um, that maximizes or optimizes uh, the system and interventions within a set of constraints. Um, I know it's kind of difficult, but I think there's an opportunity here to um, bring that better thinking, uh, our better thinking into a, a more quantified way of um, demonstrating the impact that we would want to achieve. Obviously, that gives us a, a chance to monitor and evaluate the, 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 the performance of the strategy that we're putting forward. That was really my point. Yes, thank you so much. And maybe we can continue, and then in the end, we, we have more time for questions and comments. Uh, perfect. Then uh, intelligence, the, the key learnings that uh, I would like to share with you. Um, the just transition uh, could be compared a little bit to, to HR. Uh, if we were Looking at, at what is in, in this jar, we would see that there are the stones. There are the key decision makers and key stakeholders of the just transition, and they are pretty much uh, in the loop what is already happening. They are attending the just transition platform. They know what kind of technical assistance is available. They know pretty much about the, the calls uh, happening. 
and uh, they know how to, let's say, navigate uh, more or less through uh, this just transition world. And uh, looking from a distance, maybe someone could, could say that uh, the jar is already full. And uh, this is rather the first step. Uh, we need to come closer to, to look more, to look better what, uh, what, uh, where is, are those missing spaces in, in the jar? Uh, because actually it's, it's not full. We are missing the, the pebbles, uh, which are the towns and smaller municipalities of the just transition uh, regions and uh, the stakeholders active in the related areas. Like for example, many of the NGOs which are active in the um, social security um, social security sphere, they are thinking that the just transition is something for greens. And many, for example, businesses, other uh, academia, other associations, they are thinking that this is something just for, for the greens. And we need to bring them on board, we need to uh, we need to encourage them that they are. This is about uh, their future, and this is about the future of their communities. But we are also needing the the sand, uh, which are the entities and all of the inhabitants of of the just transition regions. Uh, we need uh, support uh, narratives, which will uh, help them to to embrace this challenge and which will help them to uh, reinvent themselves. But still, the jar. Is not full because we need also the water uh, the water which is the social capital the trust among the actors within the, the just transition ecosystem which uh, which would support the the collaboration and the achievement of uh, of the shared co-created uh, goal co-created visions and um, so the first step was already done but the following steps should expand this just transition scaffolding to, to embrace also the pebbles, sand, and fill the jar with the water. We need everyone on board and on the just transition mission. The next finding is related to, to the helix. You may be familiar with a triple helix uh, model for innovation or quadruple helix model, which is promoted by, by the European Union. Uh, these helixes, they are about uh, how successful innovation can happen, that we need different uh, different types of um, entities engaged. So in the triple helix, we need government to collaborate with the industry and the university. In the quadruple helix, uh, uh, embraced uh, among others by the European Union, there is role of civil society recognized. But um, our idea and our proposal is that we are actually proposing a heptahelix collaboration model because we found that it's not enough to uh, collaborate with, uh, for example, one civil uh, society representative of, of one side, of one, one type. If we, for example, have organized a workshop or if we are co creating. Um, common vision or, or frameworks, policies, projects, uh, programs. We can, it, it's not enough to have, for example, just one NGO which is active in, uh, let's say, green, uh, green issues or which is, for example, uh, technology oriented. We need to uh, be sure that we are having on board representatives of, of the miners because this is really, um, really touching them this this transition and it's it is about their very near future it's it's also their uh, very big uh, fear uh, we need ngos uh, but we also do need youth which is very often not there by by the table uh, which is also not properly encouraged which is um, also missing leaders which would be engaging there is very few of those people who are who are there and who are also understanding what is the meaning of this process and we need uh, all of the citizens especially those who are active and who are willing to to take part and we need to help them to uh, to be part everyone who, who wants to be uh, there to to co-create this this process so uh, this uh, heptahelix model is uh, is something what we have uh, developed to, to to support thinking around how to collaborate and then the the other learning is is uh, that those beliefs in a 
charming prints in shiny armor or or kind of silver bullets so like single point solutions for example technological or infrastructural that they will trigger big change in uh, in community or town municipality or even a region they are very helpful and especially combined with this project houses so chasing after after projects and after money in the long run, it can actually cause more damage than uh, than help. And even the reports um, done for the European Commission are happening that uh, are showing that the current just transition model is not actually that much helpful. And this is uh, this is a thing to really be uh, rethought. And uh, the damage is happening because there is no this long term thinking about the future, and there is. Uh, kind of uh, cementing in the in the old world in the old dependency uh dependency mindset that something external needs to happen and save us or one thing will 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 happen will come or will be ensured uh, to us and th this will help instead of creating this internal resilience and uh, the role of culture trust and collaboration are far unappreciated uh, what is uh, the, the current focus is more precisely about projects, money, etc. And um, similarly, also the openness to to learn and and actually to fail forward. There is a lot of fear of of learning. All, all of the officials think that they need to precisely spot the intervention, spot the investment that will magically change all of the city. And um, I uh, I did put here a, a picture from from Bilbao. This is uh, next to Guggenheim's museum, because I wanted also to, to mention this uh, so-called Bilbao effect. Many people are uh, thinking that the Bilbao effect happened because the museum, uh, this Guggenheim's famous museum was created there and it attracted many tourists and this way it triggers the, the change in the city. And also many, many, decision makers many mayors of of uh, of dependent cities are believing that one uh, investment will will bring this this big change uh, also some of them are are exactly precisely thinking about uh, changing the minds onto onto museums and uh, they are not even uh, thinking of the fact that the mine was uh, employing a couple some thousands of of people and the museum would be employing 10, 15, maybe, much, much less. So uh, the Bilbao effect, actually, it is not about the museum. And we are collaborating with uh, with uh, Gorka uh, Espiao, who's uh, from Aguirre Legendecaria Center, who, who has spent years on researching the Bilbao's effect. And um, we are also... Uh, using his his learnings and uh, using this example that uh, what the real Bilbao effect is that people from from Bilbao from uh, from the administration from the business com all of the community they came together they told to themselves we cannot be stuck in a city which is which is collapsing which is uh, going through a severe crisis we need to come together and we need to reinvent ourselves and then they they started to to change. They had a very coordinated approach and following uh, common vision. Uh, they they had actually portfolio of of different activities, and the the museum itself it was rather uh, it it happened already after after several years of uh, this transformation happening. So it was rather a symbol um, of this transformation, not a trigger. Of the transformation, and this is something what uh, many people are not looking into, and they are not understanding. And this is also uh, why many similar initiatives, where someone tries to establish just one uh, one building or some point of infrastructure, many of them have failed because they were not uh, looking at all of the all of everything what was. What was connected it was not looking at, at the society at the culture and all the other factors influencing and uh, the the other learning that i wanted to share with you is that transformative processes and tools they they do exist and uh, they have already been tested and uh, they support co-creating visions and and portfolio and portfolio of, of learnings 
and concrete actions. And uh, here you can see an example from, from this work of uh, Aguirre Legendecaria Center, Iberdrola and Polytechnic de, de Madrid. Um, this work was uh, carried in into Spanish towns. Uh, it, it's uh, it's been happening already uh, for almost three years, and uh, soon they will be sharing also their their results, which are very very promising. And uh, the the steps are to listen, uh, to map the system, to collectively interpret uh, with the community, to co-create the solutions, and to uh, help to to transform in a in a long term. So uh, this kind of approaches. Um, can be very very helpful and this kind of uh, tools uh, they have already been been tested uh, and i hope that uh, they can be also an inspiration for for you so now is the time for a little bit of our discussion oh my god we i think i have exceeded a bit of the time sorry for that i hope that you you can still stay and and yeah let's talk a little bit <laughs> Great, thank you, Anita. Great presentation and yeah, very interesting subject, right? There is some, oh, we we are at the end of, of the hour. So if you want a further discussion, we're happy to stay maybe just five minutes, 10 minutes more. But of course, um, yeah, if you have to go, thank you for, for attending. It was great having you here and yeah, we can start a bit of the, the discussion now. If you have that that time, I will share the, the slides with you now. Um, but yeah, thank you everyone for, for attending. I think we had uh, Michael uh, was asking for the reference of the of the project. Mm, so of, of this last one or uh, which one? Which project? Or the Postcode Future Lab? Yeah, if I'm not mistaken, uh, is this one? But I, yeah, I think he had to go now. But yeah, I will uh, quickly share the the PDF with you all. Yes, so you can I can also that. make sure that oh. uh, more links are there. <laughs> yes, great. So does anyone have any uh, questions or anything that you'd like to address while I find here the PDF? No. Oh, Joss, yes. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Anita, it was great. <clears throat> um, I guess uh, well, it looks yeah very similar to to what we do really, uh, not surprisingly. Uh, it's all about systems innovation, but I guess there's a couple of well, one one piece I I didn't see was the mapping part of it. Uh, did you do much of that in the project? Uh, normally people pull out flashy maps and uh, wow everyone with those. I didn't see any. Yeah, so um, we've been doing system mapping uh, within uh, previous projects, uh, for example, for, for municipality of Rybnik, uh, but uh, we do not have for now like a really drawn system map of uh, all the JT uh, system, let's say in, in Europe. This is partially to, due to the fact that uh, actually part of our challenge uh, previous year was to to create a value proposition of, of this project to, to be able to live after the EIT's funding. So we really needed to focus on trust building with the, with the stakeholders and actually not everyone is so much uh, into mapping the system. This is, uh, I would say that uh, for quite some people, it is a difficult exercise. And uh, also some restrictions like some portion of uh, collaborations happening um, not in a, in a room within we could sit with everyone who should be there. Uh, th this was this was a, a part of the, of the challenge and the reason for which this, this hasn't uh, happened. But we hope that we will be able to, to do it later on, especially within this uh, main lab uh, structure. 
Great, thank you. Does anyone else have any other questions or any comments about the projects in general? No. Okay, I, yeah, since uh, we passed a bit of the time, then uh, I had some, some questions here, but I will just, uh, yeah, leave for another time when we, if we have Anita back, then we can address them again. So, yeah, thank you everyone for, for participating. Thank you, Anita, for being here. Thank you so for much. Presenting everything. And yes, we're going to share the recording as 